All right. So look, without any further ado, we'll we'll have a little bit of a chat, I guess, about managing milk components. This is the sort of phone call as as nutritionists that we we start expecting to get. You know, generally a little bit earlier than now. We're probably through the the worst of the window on the butterfat issue, but it can still raise its head. And particularly if we get a bit of rain and a flush of grass again, it could jump up very very quickly and and become an issue. But I think you know what's been really fascinating here is that we've followed the a, a case in very very close detail and also followed some of the financial issues associated with it and yeah again I'd like to thank Tom and, and Trev and the Middlebrook family for, for putting up their data here because they've been very open to what's come up and it's, 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 it makes for a fantastic case study just how we sort some of this stuff out on, on at the farm level. So look, just a bit of a bit of history I guess we the herd at, at, at Bowman Farm like most herds through through the autumn have had a bit of a uh, a shortage of fodder. We've all had uh, a delayed planting around the farm. Some of the pastures that we got away have been exceptionally good quality, but it's taken a while and maybe a bit longer than we'd like to get all these pastures into the rotation. And as a result, at the at, at the middle brooks, they were feeding you know a very high level of concentrate, you know, which which we can absolutely manage. Part of this was through the dairy. Part of it was with a, a partial mixed ration based on some kikuyu silage that they'd made early in the season, and prior to that, some forage sorghum silage. But we'd always had one really good feed of high quality pasture, you know, pretty much from, from the end of April onwards in that. And I guess the photo there from, from some of that pasture shows some of the lovely pastures that they've been producing up there this year. That was giving us an optimal position with respect to margin over feed cost at the time. Cows are cranking along at 24, 26 litres in that range and our components are in a good, pretty good place. I guess what we're confronted with, which is something which is pretty typical mid, you know, mid winter up in the mid north coast and hunter when the pastures really start to kick, is that we get a, a huge increase in those growth rates of pastures. Quite often we're at the end of the, of the season where our silage or our hay reserves are run out. And then the move, I guess, is to basically drop out the feeding on the feed pad and basically resort to, to feeding in the dairy. And at this situation, the grain was kept fairly high because it was still just a bit short of feed. And you know we hadn't probably responded collectively to, to to that change in feed conditions as they came on. Okay, so look here's here's some really interesting charts here. I guess what we've got here um, is 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 the journey with 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 the milk fat and the milk protein on the farm. And what we've got here mapped out, if we look at this green line here, where I'm just following along, that's our fat percentage. Okay, and what we can see we're trucking along reasonably at three five three six, and then all of a sudden around the 21st of August, we really started to take a bit of a dog, okay? Now, in combination with that, if we look at the orange, we can see that the kilograms of fat track this very closely. So the volume of milk that we're producing hadn't changed greatly at that stage, but our fat test had dropped and our fat yield, our kilograms of milk solid produce had dropped dramatically. At the same time, our protein percentage probably crept up a little bit, and our kilograms of protein had remained really relatively stable and if anything had probably gone up a little bit in time. So we had a little bit of a look at, at the implications of this, okay, and, and this is the point of time here where things started going pear-shaped, but basically uh, over that time our change in protein, an increase in protein, that was actually a net benefit to the system. We often think well you know we get paid more for protein than fat, we don't need to worry too much about fat, but in this situation, that was actually giving us probably a net benefit of about $150 a day for this herd. Now we put this in context, the herd is milking around 400 cows at the moment, okay? But our drop in butter fat, okay, we'd actually dropped off about 55 kilograms of butter fat production at that time. And that represented a net loss in that situation of about $358 a day, okay? Based on $6.50 per kilogram of butter fat. So our net position on a daily basis was about minus $208. If we look at that across the week, from here to here on a weekly basis, if we hadn't done anything about this situation, we we're actually looking at going backwards by about $1,456 per week in the negative situation, all right? So around here is where we really started to get concerned and we started to change a few things, all right? And really start to investigate what was happening. And I guess these are the things that we really needed to look through when we were assessing what was going on at, at, at Tom and Trev's farm. So I guess the things when we were working through a butterfat program is, is that it's not just about acidosis. I think we've got a lot more understanding that, that, that acidosis isn't the prime issue with butterfat production, particularly on pasture-based farms. One of the things we're learning more about is this, is, this has got a, a much greater 
relationship with some of the changes that we're seeing grass and particularly very high quality well fertilized pastures that may actually be getting a little bit short with respect to leaf length and leaf extension number and in particular we see some bat build up in the pastures of some specific fatty acids which we know can have quite a significant impact on milk fat production so one of the first things i think that we really need to look at when we're looking at a butterfat problem is our, is our actual pasture management in particular and I guess the questions we need to ask, you know, are we under allocating pasture? Is it just not enough grass and forage in the system? Because that can cause a butterfat pr problem. But conversely, if we over allocate pasture, that can also cause a butterfat problem. And it does that by allowing the cows to become extremely selective. They basically will take just the tops off the grass that they want, which is very high, sorry, very low in, in fibre, very low in NDF, higher in sugars, but also higher in fats. So we need to go and actually have a look and see how these cows are actually grazing the paddocks. Okay, are they undergrazing? Are they overgrazing? And it's very important that we don't just look at what's being allocated. We need to actually go out and observe what's being eaten. We'll have some photos of that shortly for you. Very important also that we check our ration formulations. Our forage to concentrate ratios are important. You know, once we get above 40% of our total dry matter coming from concentrate, we're at a much higher risk of butterfat depression doesn't mean that we can't get good butterfat with that if the other factors are right, but it puts it at a high risk if some of these other factors that contribute to butterfat, which I'll summarise later, are out of kilter. We also need to have a really good look at, at the actual grain that's being fed. We need to look at the processing. Is it being over-processed? Is it being turned into flour, particularly if it's wheat or triticale based? Because flouring your grain will increase the surface area, okay, and it'll greatly increase the risk of um, that interacting with the rumen to reduce rumen pH, but also interfere with the normal hydrogenation processes of some of those fats that impact butterfat. Look at the grain choice. What are people using? Wheat and trip, always a high risk of butterfat depression. Barley's intermediate. Corn, pretty good most of the time. Okay. And again, look at our buffering. And again, if we are using supplementary forage as part of our strategy to control butterfat, let's just make sure that one, it's palatable, two, it's being eaten, and three, can all the cows actually get a crack at it? So often if we've just got a single ring feeder there, we'll find that the small number of cows dominate that forage and a lot of the cows that need it do not get it. So forage access is a critical thing to look at. Here gives us a really nice picture, I guess, of what, of what we were seeing at, at Tom's at the time. In the top left hand corner here, we can see one of the pasture allocations and obviously there's a vast amount of forage there on offer. You can see with the motorbike, things have really got away and it's terrific to see that in a year, particularly given what we've come out of. But if you have a look below, which is the picture post grazing, you can actually see that there's a whole lot of stubble left. So the cows here really had that capacity to just select the tops out of that pasture. We've probably had a relative over allocation at the time. And as a result, they're not eating down into the more fibrous part of the pasture. This has got implications for both the diet at the time. Okay, we'll certainly see those high milk proteins, but it can help interact with this butterfat issue. And Josh will probably talk a bit later about the implications for this sort of grazing with respect to future regrowth and how our pasture quality is going to come back in, in subsequent rotations. Hey, Nick. Yeah, Josh. Um, yeah, just just on that, like I've seen this quite prolific across the area this year. Um, just because of you know, after the floods, we come through, we planted, and then um, there was a lot of fertilizer put out through the winter period, which we wasn't getting the response from. Yeah. Once that started to dry out, and we started getting some decent root growth, there was just an explosion of feed, and you know, in that July August period. Um, yeah, seen a lot of this around around the area. So it's really Absolutely. And, and I think because so much of the area got planted at the same time, just in one response, it was all actually ready at the same time as well when it really did get a bit of oxygen into those roots as well. So, so you know, big, big challenge. If we look here on the right, okay, we've got here is a classic Channel and Islands type grazing scenario, okay, where the cows, you can see where they've grazed quite hard the previous rotation, okay, but, and then you've got these areas of high fertility or the urine and manure patches where they've left a fair bit of feed last time, but we've had a fair bit of regrowth in those areas as well. And if you actually look where most of the feed in this paddock has come from, and Tom's been kind enough to pull some of it out and have a look, a lot of that's only two leaf ryegrass, okay? So very, very short, and that's actually providing most of the feed here. And again, you know, it's, it's quite normal to see this grazing pattern. We've probably come a little bit shorter on our rotation that we, than we'd like at that time. 
okay? But because we were running very short of forage, we didn't want to refill the shed with hay, okay? And, you know, that was a decision that was made and we've looked to, to actually manage this in different ways moving forward rather than readjusting the rotation. So again, very, very volatile pastures. So I guess the critical thing, what did we do? Um, and again, again, because these are, are normally caused by multiple factors, we've actually addressed multiple things in this situation. Firstly, we did a step down of concentrate. And I think this is, this is quite profound, both because of the impact on altering the forage to concentrate ratio in the diet, but it's also going to hopefully make these cows a little bit hungry when they go out and they're going to eat further down into that pasture. That's going to improve our utilisation of pasture, but it's also going to encourage them to eat the more fibrous part of the pasture, which is important from a rumen function perspective. What it did, what we did, we actually took about a kilo off them a day, okay, every probably second day for about over a week and brought them down from that 11, 11 and a half kilos to seven, seven and a half kilograms. We added bicarb. We added that at about 200 grams per head per day, okay? We actually retained the same pasture allocation to encourage deeper eating into the pastures, all right? We didn't need to offer more pasture or more feed. We wanted to maintain our rotation at that stage. And if we got them to eat deeper, we are hoping that a lot of our fibre would come from there. We didn't actually add any hay in this situation. But moving forward, we've just introduced some corn in place of the barley and that's had an interesting effect, but we didn't do that till probably four or five days ago. And as we move forward, we're going to continue to assess the pastures, see if we can continue to re reduce grain. We're looking for a bit more rain in the dry land to do that at the moment. And eventually we'll probably test removing the bicarb. But I guess if we look here on the left, this is some of the pasture residuals now. And Josh, are you a bit happier with that than where we were previously? Yeah, perfect. Looks real good. Yeah, so we're, we're pretty happy. So I guess, well, what was the effect? All right. So look, if we basically had the effect here when we, when we got to, this is where we started making some changes, okay? I think the thing you've got to be really careful with when you're looking at butter fat and, and, and influencing butter fat, we can crash it pretty quickly over a week, but it often takes 10 to 12, 14 days to resolve once you start making changes. It's a slow turnaround. And I think it's really important for you to be communicating with your, with your milk company. Say you've got stuff going on, we're actually doing something about it. Just be patient with us. You know, just let them know that changes are being made. And I think that just really helps smooth that, that, that relationship. And I think if the company, milk companies know that you're actually dealing with the issue, you know, they've got a lot more confidence in supporting you with any of the issues around pay and payment moving forward. We really probably hit our peak or our problem here, which was probably three or four days after we dropped our, our grain to its lowest level and introduced the bicarb. But then we started seeing a steady increase in butterfat production again, okay? And both the percentage went up steadily, but also it was being tracked quite nicely by the kilograms of butter fat as well, okay, which is the driver of what we're getting paid. So we've maintained effectively milk volume. We've dropped back our protein a little bit. It's come back as far as yield is concerned. And if we look at that in terms of numbers, that reverse in protein at 15 kilos, we'll put that back off the ledger. So we've lost $150 a day there. Our butter fat back up where we wanted it to be is back up at plus $358 a day. So again, we've got that improvement from where we were back to effectively, you know, a normal situation of $1,456 per week, okay? But it's really important to look at the costs of what we've done here and how that interplays with the economics in the situation. Yep, there's a cost to adding that bicarb, all right? It came in at about $100 a day extra that we had. So there's a $100 a day cost in that situation. However, by reducing our grain at that time, we were able to drop our costs by about $400, $480 for that herd per day, you know, which is actually quite profound. So if we actually look at our net position, it's about $588 a day better than when we were at the base here, okay? Put that in terms of a week, it's over a $4,000 per week reversal of our situation of where we were. So a very, very positive space economically, driven by both restoration of our components, but importantly, also driven by really looking very closely at the cost side of things and our grain use and grain that we didn't need to be using in that situation, particularly when we had a surplus of pasture. Now, interestingly- Neil, just- Yeah, Josh. That one, Neil. Um, 
the other things really that come out of that as well is is now you fix that residual with your with your pasture, your next grazing you're gonna have better quality. Yep. Okay. So we, we've got you know benefits there as well, um, and that regrowth and and we haven't had to spend money on fixing the residual with uh, with mechanical means etc cetera, etc cetera, which we'll talk about a bit later on. But you know, there's so many more benefits outside of just the initial uh, benefit as well going forward. Uh, look, it's terrific, Josh, and and, and I guess. You know, one of the things that we'll be talking about in a few weeks again, and we're starting to see already, is a slight tail off in, in, in milk protein, particularly as some of these lower quality, poorly grazed pastures start moving into our rotation. So if we can maintain that pasture quality from now on and get that residual eaten well, we're gonna come back with much softer, higher quality regrowth. And that's gonna greatly support our milk protein situation as we enter, enter, enter spring. Yeah. This morning, I've just got back some additional data on, on production since the corn's been in. And I, what this has been able to do, when we looked at the corn, I think the difference in price per tonne was about $60 per tonne, okay? Now we did about a three kilogram swap at this stage. Okay, so that's cost us about 20 cents per cow per day. So across the, the 400 cows, that's been about an $80, um, $80 a day change. We've picked up since then, and it won't only be because of this, there's been some changes in pasture condition. We've been able to maintain our milk, fat and protein, but the cows have effectively come up an additional two litres per cow per day since we've moved across um, from just straight barley to corn, which has more than paid for that shift in that concentrate price from barley to corn. Now, Luke, I can see you sitting there, mate. You've, you've had some experiences with corn this year and you've gone with nearly all corn in your diet. Have you got any comments on how that's impacted production at your your farm? Yeah, uh, good morning, Neil and everybody. Um, yes, we've for this year, we've gone straight corn for the first time ever. We normally go in with a, a wheat corn mix or a, a barley mix. Um, yeah, as Neil just mentioned, as the prices move closer together, we we decided with Neil's advice that that was the best way to go straight corn as we seem to find getting good quality wheat a bit of an issue at times, whereas the corn seems to be pretty well right. So yeah, our herd's currently averaging 28 litres, which is the most I've ever done. And um, there's a few other things contributing to that too with, with our calving pattern, etc. But with that, we've got a disc mill, which is important, I think, to make sure you can process it properly. And also the other one you've got to be careful of is gridding corn, that um, you, you want feed corn, not gridding corn. So, um, and yeah, the, the, the fat and protein, we're running at 4% at four fat and 3.3 three protein. Yeah, which is, which is pretty, which is good. Luke, that'll have you sitting over two kilos, which is a pretty pretty handy target for a, for a mixed breed herd. I think it's, it's, it's excellent, particularly for a year-round calving herd at this time. Yeah, so I look, should I have mentioned, yeah, should have mentioned that too, Neil. That's the first time we've ever got to two kilos. We've got to about 1.8 and couldn't quite crack it. So that's been another great achievement too. Oh, well done, mate. No, that's excellent. So look, I think a, a fair bit there, and I guess look, worth summarising, and I guess, you know, a lot of people work, want to work out how to, how to prevent things. I think the best way to work out how to prevent things is to work out how to cause things. So I like to think about, Butterfat problems is well. How do we cause a butterfat depression? And and if we can work out how we cause it, then we can probably avoid it from happening. So look, I think the first thing where we see more problems than anything else is if we have predominantly wheat or triticale based diets. Okay, and there's a bit of a perception that triticale is, is a lot better than wheat. It can be, but we did quite a bit of work um, in a Dairy Australia project, grains to milk, probably about ten years ago, that looked at triticale. It was actually a very wide range of fermentation within triticale cultivars that a lot of people aren't aware of. Some of the triticales are actually just as volatile as wheat and just as capable of causing butterfat depression, particularly if it's over-processed, okay, and, and at reasonably high levels in the diet with a flush of ryegrass. Feeding great, greater than seven to eight kilogram of concentrate in sort of average cow weights or greater than 40% of your total dry matter intake has concentrate is going to increase risk. Grazing really well fertilised one to two leaf ryegrass and clover pastures on short rotations. If you do that, you've got a really high chance, particularly if you're doing it with wheat, of causing butterfat problems. If you feed greater than eight kilograms diameter of this pasture, or if you're 
giving excess allocation of that for pastures to their actual requirement, which gives us that selection problem that we've seen, you know, at, at Middlebrooks. Restricting access of the whole herd to palatable fibre. Okay, so if you are using fibre as part of your, you know, feeding some hay or some straws or some other silages to try and maintain it, if the whole herd can't get at it, you've got real issues. Or well, similarly, if we're using pasture to manage butterfat, if they're undergrazing, it's consistently going to be an issue. Poorly buffered diets, but let's all remember that the first buffer we should be looking at is enough effective fibre in the diet to maintain rumination and cud chewing. The other buffers on top of that, such as bicarb, yep, they can be very important. If we have other sources of vegetable oils in other feeds other than the fat and pasture, that can be a major issue as well. Corn hominy through winter can be problematic. We've recently seen a case in Queensland in a TMR herd where instead of getting solvent treated canola, they got mechanically extracted canola, which had a much higher oil content. That oil in the canola was able to depress butter fat. We've seen it also with the fat in brewer's grain when that gets excessive. Highly processed, very short chop silages or TMRs that are over processed. Okay. Neil, that can be problematic just, as well. Neil, just on that um, that oils. Yes, James. How does the oils depress the milk fat? What, what's yeah, okay. So, so it's a great question, James. There's a specific oils in there that are C18-3 um, fats. Okay, so there's a couple of specific fatty acids. They're in grasses and they're in some of the vegetable oils as well. Now, normally when they're eaten in the room and under good by cows, they go through a process called biohydrogenation, okay, which makes them relatively safe when they're absorbed by the cow. If there are any alterations to that biohydrogenation process of some of these polyunsaturated C18-3 oils, they can be directly absorbed in the small intestine, okay? And in very small amount, they will actively impact the fat production cells in the udder and depress butter fat production. So there's been a bit of, quite a bit of work done on this and there've been some experiments in the States, James, where they've actually directly infused these oils, specific fatty acids into the intestine and it's dropped the butter fat percentage by one whole percentage point by doing it down into the twos by very small amounts of it. So it's actually a direct depressive effect on, we think, the fat production cells and mechanisms in the udder itself. So it's, it's not acting as a fat that's being converted to fat in the udder. It's actually acting as effectively a, a, a pharmacological agent to depress butter fat production. There's a bit of interesting stuff on the DA website that, that we can circulate um, just on some of the chains on this, where it's actually coming up, you know, as quite much better understanding of this. So a lot of what we thought was just room and pH problems through causing butter fat. Yep, in an environment of low pH, this biohydrogenation pathway is, 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 is further negatively impacted. Okay, but it's, it, it looks like a lot of what we're seeing on, on, on both pasture induced butter fat depression, as well as some of these stuff that we've seen more complicated rations is around this, this issue around these polyunsaturated fatty acids. Yeah, thank you. Pleasure, James. Thanks for the question. Um, and again, look, excessive rates of menensin, if they get a bit high, and again, a high percentage of North American Holsteins with a history of selection for, for low fat percentage. Okay, now, all of those on their own, you know, we can manage, okay? It's more likely to occur when we're seeing two or three or four of those factors occurring in combination. I've seen really good fat percentages on wheat and triticale based diets, okay? But if I've seen that in combination with one and two leaf ryegrass being grazed, it becomes much more problematic. I've seen plenty of high fat production from Holstein herds, okay? And again, you know, a lot of people, the answer to low butter fat was buying more juices, okay? But you know, that, that that or crossbreeding, and that's okay, that's one strategy. But we know that with the right diets, and particularly when we start introducing things like corn and better grazing management, we can get very satisfactory butter fat production in those Holstein herds as well. So all of these things are important. Um, yeah, none of them in isolation. And hopefully there's a you know some some stuff there that some people can take from this presentation. And thanks again to to the middle books. Has anyone got any any more general questions of this this chapter? That's great, yeah. Fantastic.